So I've played about 60 hours of Wild Hearts to date. Overall, I've quite enjoyed the game as a unique take on the hunting genre. And I wanted to put together a video to help out anyone who's just getting going. These games can be pretty complex with a lot of nuance and depth. Uh, I guess technically this would be considered a tips video, but mostly I just wanted to share some stuff that I've learned in my time playing that I think would be helpful to people um, just to know things from the start. And a big thank you to EA for sponsoring today's video. Uh, it's my favorite type of sponsor, one for a game that I am actively enjoying and playing, easy as it can be. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and get right into the video. Let's start off with combat. Um, my first suggestion would just to be spend time learning your weapons, various movesets. And while that might sound like an overly simple tip, it's because it extends much further than what the game introduces you to. So the game has a tutorial where it has you attack this dummy bear and it introduces you to some basics of your weapon, like the attack chain combos and a few different attack variations, but there's actually many more types of attacks than what the game will explicitly tell you. There are attacks associated with dashing or dodging, there's a sliding attack, there are jumping attacks, which also vary depending on the height that you jump from. On top of that, there are many attack variations that chain off of the multiple Karakuri in the game. So there's an attack type for if you jump off of a crate, and like I said, this can also change based on the elevation. There's an attack type for when you launch off of a spring, or there's even an attack type as a follow-up from interacting with a torch. Typically, when you interact with a torch, it does some sort of a move to chain off of it. Like with my weapon, it does a spin move. But if I immediately attack after, that itself also has a unique chain. Basically, my suggestion is to just play around with this stuff. And this is a new game after all, so people will be finding out all sorts of tricks when it comes to the ways the different weapons can attack and the different situations in which they have these unique attacks and combos. And this stuff will just keep rolling out in the coming days and weeks. So try some stuff out yourself. Maybe you'll be one of the people who finds something out new about one of the weapons. It's one of the exciting things about a brand new game like this. The second combat related tip is to not sprint in the middle of combat ever. Okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration. You will want to sprint sometimes, but what you need to be aware of is that moving from the attack stance to start beginning a sprint makes you very vulnerable for pretty much like one or two seconds. Basically, as you begin in the sprinting animation, your character has to first sheath their weapon. And during that animation, you are completely vulnerable to an attack from the boss. A big mistake that a lot of people, myself included, make early on is that they'll see a boss winding up or about to slam down for a big attack, lunge or whatever, and they panic and they try to start sprinting. Mouse and keyboard players, that means you're hitting shift. But doing so puts you through that sheathing animation where you are completely vulnerable and the boss is going to hit you and they will destroy you. So basically, you only want to use sprint if you're not about to be getting hit by the boss. But if there is an imminent attack and you need to avoid damage immediately, instead what you want to do is use any of the game's quick reposition or iframe mechanics. So these will include things like doing the dodge, which has an iframe, or using the movement Karakuri like the spring, which has iframes, or using a crate to dodge an attack, pulling out your glider to go over an attack or reposition quickly. On top of that, some of the weapons will also have iframe mechanics or parries or other sorts of movement attached to them to let you avoid getting hit. But yes, don't panic and start hitting sprint if you're about to get hit because in that situation, you will get hit. You only want to start sprinting when you're not about to get hit. It sounds counterintuitive, but you just have to use the other mechanisms for avoiding damage. And along those same lines, just in general, you need to get comfortable with dodging attacks and also don't overcommit when it comes to attacking. A lot of times when you're fighting a boss, you're going to have like a chance to get one to three attacks off before they do something that will damage and or knock you down if you get hit. How many times you have to attack will vary greatly depending on the weapon that you're using the boss that you're fighting, and what moves they did recently or are about to do. Um, this is just something that you will have to learn with time. I can't tell you every single boss animation and how many seconds you have to attack in between. But as you keep doing hunts versus particular kimono, you will learn the telegraphs for each move. You'll learn what they do. And more importantly, how much recovery time happens after they attack, as that is your window for dealing damage. So really, it's a dance between going in, getting a few hits off, doing some Karakuri, like dropping a bomb, 
bomb or whatever, but then avoiding what they do next. And it's just that back and forth of damaging, avoiding damage, damaging, avoiding damage. It's not a type of game that you want to overcommit to attacking. And also check that journal uh, for the effects of each boss fight. If you're having any sort of trouble with a particular boss, the in-game boss encyclopedia tells you everything you need to know. It tells you what sort of damage they deal, which you can then counter by using a gear set that has resistances to that damage. It tells you the weapon damage types, the ailments and attributes that they are weakest to, which you can then counter with weapons enhanced with those damage types or those ailments and attributes. And it also tells you what parts of their body are the softest, which in turn means that is where you're going to deal the most damage. One of the biggest things in this game to assist with combat besides attacking with your weapon are the Karakuri. And so along those lines, you need to learn the Karakuri patterns. It's kind of like building in Fortnite or any really game with complex movements. It will not feel easy at first, but once you get comfortable with it, it is super, super helpful. Being able to pop up a box to jump over an attack or to land a slashing attack or using the spring to iframe dodge, massive incoming damage or the firework to shoot down a flying boss. Once you get fluid and comfortable with building in this game, it's going to make you so much more effective and not only avoiding, but also dealing damage. And then on top of that, you should know that many of the bosses, there will have specific Karakuri that are very effective against them. Like for example, flying bosses like Fume Beak, the firework flare knocks them out of the sky when they're airborne, which will daze them temporarily, letting you get in some big damage. Any bosses that have a charge effect, like King Tust, for example, can be blocked and knocked down with a barrier, opening them up for some damage. Any bosses that deal heavy elemental damage of any kind can be easily managed with the elemental lantern, which gives you resistances. Any bosses that are weak to fire, you should be spamming the star bomb as well as the torch to imbue your weapon with fire damage. Basically, yes, every boss will have a handful of Karakuri fusions, combinations of these that are very effective against them that you should be utilizing. And then the final combat tip is you should just be opening up fights with some sort of big damage combination. So we're talking like placing down a bomb or two, putting in a spring-loaded hammer, or maybe even tethering them, loading up with some sort of a charge attack or some heavy hitting uh, combo from your weapon. Just try to front load as much damage as possible before the fight begins. It just gives you, uh, gives you a huge leg up on the encounter. Okay, the next thing I want to touch on is fight preparation, which pretty much boils down to eating food. Uh, you want to start making your own food as soon as possible. As you go about the world, you pick up things like plants and herbs and all sorts of stuff, or you fight some of the small kimono and carve them for whatever meat that they give. This will give you some sort of a boost to different stats, including your health and different offensive and defensive stats. But the biggest boost is going to come directly from then modifying these. Now, there are a few sources with which to do this. There is the drying rack, the pickling jar, the fermenting cask, and then eventually you'll get the smoker. And each one of these basically has their own way of modifying the raw resources food into enhanced versions of themselves. So you'll just want to play around with this. It is a pretty simple system. On the left hand side, as you mouse over an ingredient, it'll tell you what it currently does. And then on the right hand side, it will show you what the modified version is, how many of them you're going to get. So depending on the type of stats that you're wanting to enhance, just play around with these different food modification systems that are in the game and try to give yourself the best boost, the best buffs for whatever sort of things you're looking for. Now, one major aspect of Wild Hearts that the game doesn't really thoroughly explain to you is the base building system. So you'll be able to construct these hunter's tents. It's one of the first thing the game introduces you to, but it kind of gives you the impression that it can only go by these little glowy dragon nest things. It's sort of implied basically as they have you set up your very first, uh, very first base. Fact is though, the hunter's tents and a majority of your base items can be placed literally anywhere in the world. And this is super important because it acts both as a respawn, but also a fast travel location. So just like other hunting games, bosses will retreat and move from one area to another. Placing your tents either along these paths or near these locations are a great way to cut them off mid route or meet them to where they are retreating, which just can be an absolutely huge advantage. And I just think it's great that the game lets you build this stuff absolutely anywhere you want. Now, all of the base building structures, as they're called in the game, Dragon Karakuri, require one of the zone's five different 
different elemental capacities. So this capacity is something that you raise by unlocking additional dragon nest in the zone. They're indicated by this little icon on your map here. It's worth noting that not all nests are the same. Certain nests will increase your capacity for some specific element or combo of elements. This applies when you first unlock them as well as with subsequent upgrades. What I mean to say by this is that if there is a particular building that you're wanting uh, or a particular thing that you're trying to place down, but you lack the capacity for that elemental resource, you should be looking around the map at each of the dragon nests to see which one increases that specific capacity because upgrading a dragon nest doesn't give you increased capacity for all of them, but for specific ones. Now, initially, you will have to manually interact with a dragon nest in the world to first unlock it. But after that, you can actually upgrade these just by clicking on them via the map, which is super useful. And when it comes to upgrading the dragon the, there are two resources used to do this. One comes from boss hunts. Um, any hunt will reward a crystal for that particular region that you're in, that you're fighting that boss. And then the second crystal type actually comes from these glowing piles. You'll find them out in the world. They're pretty easy to spot as it's the only resource in the environment with this obvious green glow. It's the same glow actually that's seen when a boss part drops on the ground, for example. But these are fairly rare spawns. You can't miss them when they're around, but when you do see them, you should make sure that you grab them because there's not a ton of these and you will need these to upgrade your dragon nest and as I mentioned upgrading those pretty important for the base building but also for putting out those world traversal items um also once you get the chance to unlock any of the auto resource generators you should do so as soon as possible so these include the ore shrine and the food shrine each of these will just automatically generate resources that you can collect periodically and you should have these running in every zone as the resources they gather are tied to the zone that they are built in in. And then also you'll get a wildlife pen and a wildlife cage. And this is important because in later tiers of crafting, you're going to need ingredients that are collected from these tamed creatures. Uh, the encyclopedia will tells you what each one of them gives as a reward. So that's an easy way to basically gather the parts you need for a specific piece of gear. Check the encyclopedia for the tamed creatures, see which reward has the one that you need for the item that you're trying to make, and then just put up a bunch of uh, pens and or cages to house them and they will just automatically automatically generate that stuff for you. Uh, world traversal, pretty big in this game. Uh, the basic Karakuri, while they are great for getting around, you know, using the springboard and the crates and especially the glider, it's the travel focused dragon Karakuri that really open things up. Specifically, I'm talking about the wild vines, which is basically a, a self-constructed zip line that you can place and aim pretty much anywhere in the environment. The wind vortex, which will shoot you up in the sky, letting you use your glider from a quite a great height. And then the roller, which gives you basically like a little vehicle to zip around in. Uh, each of these just provide tremendous world traversal benefits. And once you start unlocking and upgrading the dragon nest in a zone, you're going to have plenty of resources to put these. In particular, a lot of the wild vines. You should have these all over the place. Zip lines everywhere. It's going to look like a tourist destination where people should be paying you for the experience of zip lining over these zones. I mean, seriously, it's super helpful for getting to, for chasing down, or for escaping from boss fights with ease. And finally, worth mentioning is that unlike the regular Karakuri, the crates in the springs that once those are destroyed, they are gone. Dragon Karakuri are permanent structures. That wild vine, the wind vortex, and the roller, they stay where you place them for good. If a boss does happen to destroy one, and this will happen, as soon as they leave the area, it will instantly and automatically rebuild itself. So unless you are physically dismantling it, these Dragon Karakuri aren't going anywhere, even further emphasizing their importance. Uh, let's talk briefly about co-op, uh, there's a few things I think you should know. So for one, when, whenever you start a new hunt, the game is going to prompt you to open up a lobby. So if you're looking for help, you can go ahead and do so. You are also able to search for hunts at the campfire. You can look around and try to queue up with somebody else who's going on a particular hunt. But then on top of that, there are these hunter's gates. They're scattered everywhere in the zone. You can't miss them. They're these little glowing areas. Interacting with one will show you a list of active hunts that people are engaged in in your area that you can choose to join. And this is really great if you don't want to, if you're not looking to complete a particular quest and you want to farm a boss and you want to help other people who are doing so themselves, just go to one of these gates, interact with it and pick the boss that you're looking to farm. And you're just instantly loaded in with them and join wherever they happen to be in their current hunt. Now it is worth knowing though, that there is difficulty scaling. So this means the fights will get harder, the more players in them. Also, in my opinion, 
they're a lot more fun than with more players as much as I do play and have played a lot of this game solo you get a lot more enjoyment when you play with other people even if it's just randoms that you're queuing up with in matchmaking all right so I want to wrap up quickly here with a few general tips for one the hunting tower you place these down it will scan and show you any bosses in a fairly large area but it's not enough to cover the entire map so generally you're going to want to place like three or four towers in every zone the good news though is that once you activate a single tower all other towers on the map will scan so once you've placed enough of them you can cover the entire map instantly as soon as you load in you interact with one tower the whole map is scanned you automatically know where whatever boss you're hunting is just like that and speaking of the scans whenever you scan and you see a big question mark that's moving around that indicates that there is a boss or a boss variation that you have yet to kill why that's important is because every time you see a question mark and you go there and you take out that boss that will be a brand new weapon and armor set unlocked so basically anytime I see a question mark boss um, as I've played through the game I make that my first priority to take them out because many times it's going to mean I get an upgraded tier of armor and or weapons that I can make making me stronger and continuing that whole gear progression that these games are built all of, all around sell the kimono junk to the vendor so bosses will drop an item that's entire purpose is to be sold off to the game's vendor the vendor is located in the middle of the major town uh, this isn't used for anything else it's not used for crafting or any sort of gear or consumable so whenever you see these little discs here the ones that say they can be sold to a vendor don't be scared sell them to a vendor get your gold which you will be needing for crafting your weapons and armor also in town the guild of the fishermen has jobs for you you should be collecting these they're pretty simple stuff it's just a lot of times things you'll be doing while you're out on hunts anyways every single job rewards a set number of seals and this is basically a tiered reward progression unlocking materials resources and then once you reach 30 seals gold at that point quests then reset and you can do it over and over again this is basically just like a good side hustle to do in addition to the uh, boss farming that you'll be doing make multiple weapons this is really crucial in my opinion you should be having even if you're just sticking with one weapon type like me I'm I'm playing Nadachi that's the weapon that I use I have got multiple weapons going down multiple different tiers getting multiple different benefits at the final weapon that I'm selecting different damage types different perks all of that stuff uh, you should you should not be relying on just having one weapon and then trying to switch it whenever you want a different elemental type just make multiple weapons you will be collecting the boss parts necessary and then finally I just want to let you know that you should be checking that Karakuri upgrade tree often there are some really huge and super beneficial things in here including the ability to carry more healing items to unlock new Karakuri that you didn't previously have and then to get some pretty big upgrades for existing ones I mean these are some huge things like one of them for example gives you more iframes on the spring Karakuri more iframes obviously a really good thing in a game about uh hunting big monsters that flail around and do a lot of damage but that pretty much does it for my tips guides hints whatever you want to call this a video that I hope will be helpful to anyone getting started with this game like I said these are just some of the things that I've picked up on over the past uh, 60 hours of playing that I think might be useful information for people hopefully it was for you thank you for watching hope you enjoyed it I'll see you next time